Hello, you're listening to the Unlocking Landscapes podcast. I'm your human host, Daniel Greenwood. This is part one of two episodes with author Julian Hoffman. Julian has published two books of non-fiction with a strong focus on landscapes, wildlife and heritage. In 2012, Julian's book, The Heart of Small Things, was published. And in 2019, it was followed by Irreplaceable, The Fight to Save Our Wild Spaces. I'm a big fan of both of these books. Julian does that rare thing for a nature writer and centres communities within the landscapes he writes about, placing people at the heart of conservation. Irreplaceable is a great example of this, with Julian writing about local people the world over battling to save special places, habitats and species. Make sure to tune into the second episode to hear more about Irreplaceable, the highly commended finalist for the 2020 Wainwright Prize for writing on global conservation. It's beautifully written and is full of wonderful human stories and insights into landscapes across the world. In episode one of this podcast, Julian talks about his life in Prespa in northern Greece, close to the Prespa Lake a boundary shared by Greece, Northern Macedonia, who beat Germany in football just the other day, and Albania. Julian is a very gifted speaker, and I'm sure you'll be entertained by his descriptions of the intensely rich landscapes of the Presba Mountains, its cultural traditions, and enviable richness of butterflies, plants, and other wildlife. Julian talks in detail about the closeness to European brown bears, yes, bears, in his day-to-day life. That's something you can only dream of in Britain. Julian details how he came to live in Prespa, how he became a writer there after working with his wife as a market gardener, toiling away in the open fields growing fruit and vegetables and getting to know the locals. We also talk about Julian's new focus and something much smaller than a bear, the common European bird, the wren. Thanks so much for bearing with us and I hope you enjoy the episode. Hi, Julian. Welcome to Unlocking Landscapes. Hi there, Daniel. Thank you so much for joining me today. The first question I'd like to ask you is, what have you been up to? Really good question. Um, What have I been up to? Well, what I've been up to literally today is to start preparing for an enormous storm that's about to sweep in over northern Greece uh, tomorrow morning, bringing heavy snowfall and a drop in temperatures of about 20 degrees Celsius. So I'm getting the wood split for tomorrow, um, getting the bird feeders topped up, make sure all the wood piles are the tarp on them way down. Uh, So that's what's been going on today. Um, In a more general sense, I've been starting slowly to work on a new book that's called Shelter, and that's kind of in response to the pandemic uh, in some respects. And what I, one thing I'd like to share with you uh, about the book is not so much necessarily what the book is uh, truly about, because I'm still kind of at the early stages, but a, a kind of scene that set off the whole project, I suppose, in the midst of the pandemic. And I suspect it's a scene that will recur again tonight as the temperature begins dropping and we're due to go down, I think, to about minus 10 tonight. Um, in the years we've lived in this this house, there has been an empty swallow's nest uh, above our front door. And it's never been used by a swallow since we've lived here. So I don't know when it was last occupied as a nest. But for the last three winters, as many as 14 wrens convened from different directions from all over this valley to shelter in this uh, hardened cup of mud that's no bigger than a human hand above our front door. Uh, And they only arrive when the temperature gets to a certain point, uh, and particularly when it comes with snow. And so they all arrive in with the last of the light Uh, And they all head out early morning. They drop out of the nest like little parachutists into a world of ice and snow and winds. So the books kind of emerged out of this core image of shelter and what it might mean um, for both humans and the non-human world to kind of seek shelter, which seems particularly resonant, I think, during the pandemic. So hopefully the wrens will arrive tonight and they'll seek shelter here and they'll they'll head out safely in, in the morning again. So I really wish I had a breaking news klaxon there or some kind of little tune like we go to a news <laughs> desk because you've heard it here first. Julian Hoffman's new book is on the way and it's called Shelter. And I love that image. I think there's something about a record in England of 50 wrens in one bird box in the winter or something like that. Did wow, you ever hear that? that? Many. 
I didn't. No, no. I'm starting slowly to do some research into Wrens and this. You know, what I find really fascinating, I think this is going to be one of the themes that that plays out through the book, though I said, as I say, it is still fairly early days, is that Wrens are amongst one of Europe's most solitary and territorial of birds. You know, rarely, rarely, rarely will you ever see more than one Wren in any given place. And yet they have this kind of foreknowledge of a potentially killing cold. And so they act against their kind of isolationist tendencies and work together to generate sufficient warmth to see them through the night. And it seems really, really important, you know, when we face, uh, when we're confronting uh, uh, the sixth extinction in biodiversity. We're also in the midst of a climate crisis that, you know, there are so many things to be gleaned from the lives of animals that are often acting in ways that we would do well to acknowledge and, and kind of take lessons from in a sense. Because I think what I've been watching with the wrens for the last three winters is this ability to to work together to avert catastrophe, something which, by and large, at a kind of political level, we're not really doing ourselves. I'm a big fan of wrens. Um, I once noticed how they have regional accents, and I think that's been scientifically proven. And I noticed it at a time when I was just getting into birds in general. I was trying to learn the basic species that we have in in England. So you know, robin blackbird wood pigeon etc and wren of course and i went to liverpool um i've got family in liverpool i support everton mm -hmm. um and so i'm quite familiar with it um but i noticed that the wren sang in a different way yeah so there is a scouse wren so Brilliant. that <laughs> and you notice it when you go to other places well they do sing differently um in in different places yeah, and I think there's certainly a, there's been quite a lot written by about the Shetland, the song of the Shetland wren, which I think is quite quite different. Yet again, another unique um, sort of sound, isn't it? And you know what I've often felt fascinating, even within um, looking at slightly different species, but where you are and where I am, we're still part, even though you're uh, you're part of an island, but we're still part of of Europe. Um, certain birds here that are the same species that you encounter behave so differently. So, for example, I remember in all the years that I lived in, in Britain, how obscure the European jay often seemed, how secretive its behavior kind of appeared to be. And yet here in southeastern Europe, they are so open, they are so confiding, they are often gathered together, they'll spend time on the lawn in the garden here. Um, they and, and often when we have visitors from the UK, they'll say, oh my God, that's a, that's a, 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 a jay, you know, and they'll get really excited and then there's another and then another and they're, they almost start cavorting around the path as we walk. And I'm just really fascinated in some of these kind of geographical distinctions or iterations of a species' behaviour that can often be profoundly different. That's really interesting you say that about Jays. Um, a friend of mine, me and a friend of mine, we were in, the, in Czechia um, in a place called the White Carpathians, which is on the border with Slovakia. Uh, it's an area of, of, of hills and mountains. And we, got, we just developed this running joke from walking there one day in September because you saw a jay every five minutes mm -hmm. and they That's would right. fly across and we'd just say jay 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 and so we sometimes just leave each other whatsapp messages and say jay whenever we see one <laughs> yes. and it's it's so true that they they are they are much more secretive in in yeah. in particularly in england um but they are amazing birds and they they are by their nature sociable aren't they yes they are and you know i think this also you know what i find fascinating is that we we do as humans have a tendency to sometimes label a species with a name and assume that there is a uh, little individuality about that species or within that species, let's say. But actually, there's a huge range of varied behaviours that might be dictated by slight genetic differences or according to uh, the geographical reach and bioregional variation. So there's, you know, you look at birds not necessarily as a species, but as individuals within a species that will often display subtle yet pronounced differences. And just going back to what you said about wrens, 
I've got Irish heritage. My grandfather was Irish, spent a long time and spent a lot of time in Ireland myself on summer holidays as a child and more recently. And I was I went to a place in uh, County Mayo called the Museum of Country Life. And they've got some great exhibits there about the old rural Irish traditions and stuff. But the one that really stuck with me was the Wren Boys. Have you ever heard about that? No, I haven't. I haven't. This is, this. I think there's links with, with Halloween here as well. But um, it was it was a tradition for children to go and knock on people's doors, if they even had doors, um, and say, penny for the Wren. And they'd, they'd, ah, show, yes. a, they'd yeah. show a box with a dead Wren in it. Um, and that's a that's believed to be a an old you know Celtic or mm-hmm. pagan tradition because I think wrens so, I mean I think wrens were killed to be put in the box um, you know I, I think it's not not so much of a common thing anymore to do that so how would you even kill a wren how would you how would you catch a wren they're so small um, but it seems to be it seems to be a tradition and maybe wrens had a um, quite negative connotations mm-hmm. once upon a time mm-hmm. in Ireland. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know much about the Irish tradition of, of uh, you know, how wrens appear within it. But, you know, I think a, a lot of um, species, uh, wild species, you know, we do have a kind of, um, we do have a tendency to kind of look at them as either good or, or bad to some, uh, in some respects. You know, obviously corvids by and large, uh, certainly throughout large parts of Europe, are looked upon poorly. They aren't considered to be good, inverted commas, birds. Whereas birds like the swallow, for example, you know, in a few weeks' time here, for example, on the 1st of March, uh, people in this part of northern Greece where I live, they will twine together two strands of wool. One of them will be white and the other one will be red. And we knot it together on the left wrist. And this is called the custom of Martis, which kind of refers essentially to the month of March in which swallows first return uh, to these lands. And there's a very ancient connection to this um, particular tradition that's been a little bit lost in the mists of time and it's celebrated differently throughout various parts of Europe, uh, throughout various parts of the Balkans, sorry. Um, But in its local iteration here, it's worn on the left wrist until you see the first swallow of spring. And you then cut the strands free and you decorate a tree with them in the hopes that a swallow will take up the wool and line its nest with them. Now, I've never actually seen this happen, a wren actually utilizing this offering, but beneath that um, kind of gesture is this fundamental recognition of a shared world in a way and the kind of greeting the changing or the turning world in a way the new season upon us together with the respectful celebration of a bird that's now journeying north as we speak um from africa i absolutely love that it makes me think of a book called the running sky by tim d Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which was recommended to me by my friend who i have the the running j joke with um and it, I, it was when I was first learning about things like ecology and bird life and trying to learn those bird songs. But there was one line in that book that stands out to me. And it was that, you know, when birds are singing and calling, sometimes they are actually calling to and at you. Mm-hmm. And I mm-hmm. thought that was that was really powerful. And I'm sure that there's a lot of people would agree with that because it's this there's this common idea that we are separate from nature and that you know we, we are not part of 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 that sort of life anymore but that it's true there are you know robins will come and tell you off and and yeah. and when certain birds will see you they will sound the alarm to warn other other yeah. you know fellow birds that you're around and i thought that was that's something that i've that stayed with me and it i feel like it's made me it's made me happier as a, as a person yeah. yeah so you were talking there about where you live in greece could you tell us a bit more about the place where you live, the landscape, uh, some of the wildlife you might see there and what, you know, what the people are like? Yeah, of course. Um, for the last 20 years now, uh, I've lived in a small village quite high up in the mountains above the Prespa Lakes. And my wife and I had left London uh, in order to move here. And to give you a kind of idea, I suppose, of the, the place itself, these are two 
of the oldest lakes in the world. There are two uh, Prespa lakes, Greater Prespa Lake and Lesser Prespa Lake. And they're amongst the oldest lakes in the world between about three to five million years old. And they, they sit inside this extraordinary uh, set of encircling mountains. So you literally come over a mountain pass and you drop down into this glorious bowl of blue that is only separated. The two lakes are separated by a very slim isthmus. Um, down the middle and in many respects what makes the Prespa Lakes quite fascinating not only is a place to live but for its associated biodiversity is that it's really at the crossroads it's at the crossroads of Mediterranean ecosystems and Balkan mountain ecosystems so you have this kind of overlap and blending and merging between these two very very different uh, ecological systems it's also at the crossroads of three countries. So the lakes are shared by Greece, Albania, and North Macedonia, which in itself means that there's this blurring of histories and traditions and songs and languages and ethnicities and religions around this, this lake's basin. So within this one watershed, you've got three entire, sorry, not three, but three distinct countries that share the shores. And on top of that, there's a kind of geological line that runs right down the middle of the lake. So on the uh, eastern flank of the lakes, you've got the, the, the underlying stone is comprised predominantly of granite, that kind of dark brooding stone that's very typical of, of some of the Balkan massives. But on the western shores of the lakes, you've got a very pale and porous stone, which is limestone, that kind of uh, pale stone of classical Greek myth. And those two geological substrates literally collide here and run down the middle of the lake. But what it means in real terms is that it provides dwelling grounds for the associated uh, floral and invertebrate communities that prefer to live on one or the other underlying system of stones. So you've got, for example, a profusion of orchid species, particularly on the limestone side. Whereas on the granite side, you lose those orchid species, but you get into the realm of marsh orchids much more in the boggy meadows. So what it means is that within a single basin comprised of two lakes, you have this extraordinary range of species. There's some 1800 different wildflowers found in the Prespa itself. Um, and about 270 different species of birds. But to give you some indication perhaps of that biodiversity, there are around 234 species of butterflies found in all of Greece, which is more than four times what can be found in Britain, of course. Of those 234 species of butterflies in Greece, 172 of them can be found just in Prespa alone. So it gives you kind of an indication, and one of that is that there's also this vertical diversity of habitats, because you've got these two great bodies of water, um, but you've also got these vast reed beds, you've got these extraordinarily dense thickets of oak, uh, you've got mountain beach forests, and mountain beaches are very different from those kind of lowland beaches that we might associate with southern England which tend to have these great spreading canopy. Mountain beaches, they, they rise straight up. They're spires, these great silver spires rising towards the skies. Um, you've got a lot of scrub and you've got ancient juniper groves. So you've got all of this uh, assembling together in a way that lends itself, along with its cultural richness, this fantastic um, biodiversity as well. Uh, I don't really know what to say after that because I, I just want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> you'd be very welcome. You'd be very, you'd be made very welcome as well. Thank you. Uh, One hundred and seventy-two species of butterfly. That's right. I haven't found them all, but I know there, there's a wonderful um, uh, Greek lepidopterist who has been charting the butterflies of this region for years and years and years. And he, he famously, he, he didn't drive, so he would come up on a bus and he would get dropped off um, near a mountain pass and walk over the mountains, counting up and photographing butterflies as he went. And he's charted them all and he's published some really, really nice work about the huge variety. And of course, within 
that species variety, it also means you have this kind of tonal variety. So the upland meadows in July are this extraordinary spectrum of colors. You know, you've got that, that beautiful uh, pale yellow of the clouded yellow butterfly, and you've got the, the whites of Apollos, and you've got all this kind of richness that, that unfolds across the, the mountain meadows in midsummer. And on the point of that richness, Julian, why, why is it so rich and what maintains the landscape to that level of species diversity? I mean, much of the species diversity itself stems from that kind of um, congregation or assembly, let's say, of different, different habitat types. Um, but it's been retained in many ways through a number of different mechanisms, let's say. One has been traditional land practices, one has been the fantastic work of a local environmental organization called the Society for the Protection of Prespa that has been fundamental in ensuring the viability of pelicans. We haven't even got on to the pelican colonies that exist here. So I'll come to that in a moment or two. Um, so there's, there's a variety of factors that have kind of led towards this crescendo in a way of, of habitat and species diversity. Um, and, you know, the pelicans, I should probably bring them into the story because they are a, are a real uh, principled part of this whole region. Um, there are two species of pelicans that nest on the Prespa Lakes. Uh, the white pelican, and there are around about 600 pairs of them that nest here each summer. And the Dalmatian pelican, which is a far rarer species. It's currently listed as near threatened. Um, by the IUCM, and there are about 1,400 pairs of Dalmatian pelicans that breed here, which makes Prespa the world's largest colony of breeding Dalmatian pelicans. But you know, I know you know quite a bit about your work within the conservation world, so I thought it might be worthwhile talking a little bit about um, the role of conservation in these two species, because when the um, Society for the Protection of Prespa was founded about 30 years ago. There were less than, much less, in fact, uh, less than 200 pairs of Dalmatian pelicans that nested here on the Prespa Lakes. And we're now looking at around about 1,400 pairs. And within that increase, what's even more important is that this, this was effectively the only place in Greece where Dalmatian pelicans once nested which obviously would have been catastrophic if a disease had run through the colony, if wildfire in the reeds had killed off all of the young, for example. But what's happened in recent years is there's now, there are now sufficient numbers that they have colonized a number of other Greek wetlands. So they've been spreading outwards from this focal point of the birds kind of um, breeding uh, territory and now inhabit a number of other Greek wetlands, which is really, really good news for the future. But going back just a little bit further, up until the 1970s, because I think these stories of change are really important to, to sort of guide us and to see that at times it can seem or feel quite hopeless when we're working in conservation and there are minimal changes that we might witness in any given day or week or month or even a year. But changes do occur and they are occurring and they're unfolding around us all the time because up until the 1970s, the pelicans that nested here, far, far less, uh, far lower numbers than they do today, there was a bounty on their heads so that the Greek government um, paid if you produced either the beak of a killed pelican or one of its eggs and you were given 50 drachmas for a beak or five drachmas for an egg. Um, and that was largely because pelicans were believed um, to be in competition with the human communities here over the fish that they hunted, which we now know through a number of scientific experiments that they don't depend on the same species whatsoever. And in fact, quite different species do they rely upon, those species that aren't of a huge commercial value whatsoever. Um, and then in the mid-1970s, the this place was protected. And so almost overnight, the bounty was removed. And slowly, the 
pelican population grew in size. And a lot of that has been through the work of an organization and local ecologists who have done extraordinary work um, revealing how, for example, pelicans don't compete for fish species, recognizing this uh, extraordinary animal in our midst within a shared landscape. There has also been um, renewed interest in tourism in the region of people bird lovers or you know people interested in nature have come here specifically to watch pelicans and so some of the fishermen on the lake have opened up uh, little restaurants that serve food to tourists so there's been this kind of shift this almost generational shift in a sense in a community's relationship with the wild species to the point where the pelican is now very very um, successful here across both of those species it really reminds me of what you just said of something that I saw when I, I did a conservation placement in 2011 in the Picos de Europa, mm -hmm. peaks of mm -hmm. Europe, in the mountains in Asturias in northern Spain. And it was to support the reintroduction of the Lama Gaia, mm -hmm. a bearded vulture. And there was a visitor centre there in the offices of the charity, the Foundation for the Conservation of uh, of the Lama Gaia. They call it Quebranta Huesos, which means bone breaker. Yeah. Terrible Spanish pronunciation. Sounds nice probably. though to me. <laughs> um, and it, it, in the sort of museum, it had a, I think there was some government guidance in the 1960s that had all, uh, the list of all the species that, that they were encouraging local people to kill. And that included Lama Gaia, right lynx mm -hmm. um wolf yeah. possibly i'm not, not sure about bear but i really remember seeing lynx yeah. on there and seeing um lama Gaia on there and on a kind of smaller more sort of localized level i recently recorded a podcast with chris shuler who's written a book about the great north wood in south london mm -hmm. and his research into finding that people were being paid to kill lots of different animals but particularly hedgehogs oh really in, yeah so it seems that there's this there's this culture of persecution, um, which is based on a lack of evidence. Yeah. And and I think it's interesting, isn't it, what's happening in, in the UK with the return of things like otters and beavers, because people have erroneously said that we can't have beavers back because they'll eat all the fish. Yeah. And actually beavers are vegetarian, so yeah. they're not going to eat the fish. Otters is a different story. And I mean, I've heard people talking about how much they want to shoot cormorants for taking their fish and stuff like that. So it's a really, I, th I think in Europe, it's a really challenging balance, isn't it? And it sounds like there's the, the science is winning through there. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the other thing of course, is that uh, there are a number of these larger mammals or apex predators still in place in many parts of Europe as well. And I think, one thing that's occurred to me, you know, and I, I watched some of the, you know, I tried to stay informed about issues in, in, in Britain as well regarding the reintroduction of certain species, whether that be lynx or beavers or otters in certain places. And what often comes across is this notion from detractors to those reintroductions that it's been absent, that species, whichever one it may be, has been absent for a considerable period of time and we've lost the ability to live with it. And that seems to be a kind of excuse in many ways, as though we can't adapt. You know, humans, I mean, when you look at the pandemic right now, we've proven to be, for you know, astonishingly resilient and adaptable, you know, in the span of the last 12 months at changing our lives without getting into whether, you know, that's... Um, whether those are positive changes or not, we simply have adapted to different circumstances. And I think that's, you know, it, it doesn't give, it perhaps doesn't give us enough credit for our ability to adapt. And, you know, I look at communities around here, you know, in the mountains and in the woods, just behind my house here are brown bears, you know, and on most days, on most walks, I come across signs of brown bear. Um, very, very, very infrequently will I see a brown bear because by and large, those, uh, the relationships that hold us together in place, both humans and brown bears in this watershed, means that we tend to keep to our own places. And there is this ability for both humans and wild animals to kind of 
selectively uh, find routes and ways of steering clear of humans. Not always. And w this is a, isn't a, a densely populated area either, so it's worth bearing that in mind. But the presence of bears and wolves here, you know, it's altered my relationship with the landscape. And it's altered it in a profoundly moving way in many respects, because to walk up into the beech forest behind my house is to know that I'm not top of the food chain up there. And it, it lends an extraordinary charge to the landscape, even though I'm absolutely certain I won't encounter one whilst there. But the knowledge that something is really has a way of finally focusing the world around you. And I mean that in the most positive sense. I, I would no longer wish to live in a landscape without bears, even though I recognize that there is a tiny, tiny, tiny um, possibility that I could get attacked someday. But that is so infinitesimally small. I stand far greater chance of um, being run over on the road or having a car accident or of a jet plane that I'm in crashing than of being attacked by a bear. And to live within the presence of these species is an extraordinary um, gift, I think. It's a real privilege to know that they are there, to know that those lives are existing alongside us. And we, we both call this place home. And I think it's about regaining an ability to live with other species that has to fundamentally be at the heart of the great environmental challenges that we face. And by that, I don't even solely mean reintroducing bears or wolves or lynx to, to Britain, because we often struggle to live with even the smallest of species. You know, we'll, we'll strim back to the bare bone, the verges, you know, um, of railway stations and roundabouts, you know, that inability to live with species is, isn't solely about apex predators, but is about a wider separation between humans and the more than human world. I want to live with bears as well, after listening to you talk about it like that. I've had one bear experience in my life, and it was a non-bear non experience. My friend who I mentioned earlier, when I was talking about jays, we both went to Romania, and we were we went for a walk out of a, a ski town, I think you'd probably call it that, in Transylvania, in the High Carpathians, the river valley. And we went for a walk into the mountains. And there are signs everywhere saying, attention, bears in this area. I felt really scared. Um, and it's because it, it wasn't, it wasn't not, we didn't finish our walk and turn around, but you carry with you this sense of, of vulnerability. Yeah which actually you sometimes I suppose you carry with you if you're if you're in in some cities where you know that you might be in uh in danger of something or in maybe yeah, I don't know absolutely. an away supporter at a football match <laughs> where there's a rivalry or something but we we, we didn't we didn't open our salami that we bought because we didn't want to even yeah. though I, I think they're veg vegetarians but it it had this energy about it and that we the whole time I, I definitely I couldn't turn off I couldn't kind of I couldn't tune out of that. Yeah. And it, it was a place I'd all I'd wanted to go to for a long time with a lot about, you know, the Carpathians and stuff and Romania. But I just couldn't stop thinking about the potential danger of encountering wolves and bears. And we came across these uh these woodsmen working and they were dragging you were talking there about the, the high the mountain beach forests and woodlands and they were logging it with horses yeah. and that would kind of distract me a bit. And there's always in Romania the fear of dogs, isn't there? The uh, sheep dogs and stuff. But we, we got beyond them and we kind of got to the we climbed up higher over this sort of rocky, rocky terrain. I'm not a rock climber, but I, just, I don't think I've ever felt so vulnerable mm -hmm. in a place that I would consider to be the outdoors or nature. So it's really interesting to hear you talk about living with bears in a way that you now can't do without. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and I think there is, it's, it's a healthy thing to confront that. And it's a challenging thing. And it's certainly not easy um, in any respect, because you're right, we do carry these, uh, you know, we carry these cultural inheritances with us of our relationship with the wild and whether it be about the deepest, darkest, densest woods, you know, in mythic stories or our human relationship with wolves and, and bears. But I've certainly felt far greater fear in many cities at night in my life than I ever have in the presence, the potential presence of bears and wolves. 
And, you know, I think it's about kind of recalibrating what fear means and also living well with fear because fear is an integral part of human existence. And I think it's really critically important to learn how to live with it well because by living with it well, it often is reduced inordinately in in its kind of severity so that I don't really think a great deal about bears or wolves when I'm out walking now. Um, Though the second that one appeared in a path ahead of me, that would telescope my you know thoughts right back to them in an instant, of course. But I think it's a really good approach to have to try and reimagine that relationship. And of course, the other really important thing I think to remember is that the reason you almost never, ever, ever encounter a bear or a wolf here in Prespa or in other parts of northern Greece is because they are fundamentally terrified of us. They, their sense of smell and their sense of hearing is far more acute than human sense of smell and hearing. And so they are aware of you long before you are aware of them. And so it's often only by a strange, uh, uh, strange coincidence or luck because it might be about the way the wind is blowing on a given day. Um, but by and large, they will have scarpered and you will never know that they might have been on the path before you because ultimately... Their terror is the terror of persecution. They carry their own cultural inheritance of fear in their own blood and bones. And it's no different in its enduring qualities than ours is. And I think it's good to to be reminded of that, that they are always more fearful of us than we are of them, by and large. And that's why they are pretty much strictly nocturnal. Though not exclusively, actually. I should I should I should clarify that. Um, Bears can be uh, extremely nocturnal, but in many parts of the Prespa Basin, they are out, out and about during the day. And I've recorded them on camera traps quite a lot during the day, um, sometimes just by the side of a road even, but just tucked into a little grove of oaks feeding on wild strawberries or uh, on beech mast. I, I wonder if you've seen this meme online of it's two images put together and it has a picture of a wolf, a really sort of wild, mythical looking wolf. And then I think it says like 10,000 years ago, this animal went to a, went to a campfire surrounded by people. And then the next image is of a, a little pug wearing like a, a clown hat or something like yeah, that. I'm and it's like that. 2019, I think it came out, but that was brilliant. That really hit, a, hit upon that. That's the impact yeah, that we've had on wolves. You, you make a good point about, that you made earlier as well about not being able to live with species of course in britain we are struggling to live with something like the badger which Mm -hmm. is another Mm -hmm. nocturnal animal and i'm from what i've read its nocturnal habits are also based on the fact that it's been persecuted in different ways by by people in britain for a long time and it's been in it's been living around here for i think something like three hundred thousand years maybe but yeah yeah so julian talking about the landscape that you're living in it sounds absolutely incredible and it's just it's just great to hear it we're we're not allowed to do very much at the moment in the uk in england we're only really supposed to go for one exercise walk a day you can only go for essentials so to to hear about all of the geology and biodiversity and landscape of presba is is really quite enriching i think but i wondered how as a writer living in that place affects you yeah um i mean my you know my work as a writer emerged very very clearly out of this specific landscape um and it really came out of attempting to put roots down and to make a home for ourselves here in the sense of making connections with local people and to try and understand to the best of our ability a landscape that was extraordinarily unfamiliar for me the histories in place here the paths that had been um uh you know walked into into the landscape itself they were all new many of the species were new so it was a a real deep dive into trying to get a grasp of this place which ran alongside our desire to make a home here to dwell here well and truly um but I think what, you know, when, when my wife, Julia, and I arrived here just over 20 years ago, um, I fully intended immediately to 
to devote time to becoming a writer. That's what I'd wanted to do. And simultaneously, my wife's dream was to become a conservationist. So what did we do for the first five years? Well, neither of those things. We became organic market gardeners and we rented huge fields at the foot of a mountain and grew organic uh, vegetables and, and herbs that we sold to shops in Athens and Thessaloniki. And I look back to those five years now, I, my, my back couldn't handle it anymore, but uh, those five years were probably the best practice as a writer that I've ever had, even though I almost never put pen to paper because it, it grounded me in the local community, you know, and at the end of a long blazing day of summer heat here, after irrigating the crops, you know, we would gather with other farmers over a beer and moan together about the heat and moan about the lack of water in the river this year and discuss various ways of improving uh, the irrigation system. So those days were about discussing um, uh, varieties of seeds and what was failing and what was succeeding and how to protect your crops from bears. So although I wasn't writing, it was really my way into becoming a writer here by not writing, but actually by actively doing something else that, um, that relied on the soil. Our livelihood was about the earth and what we were able to grow and the many failures that we went through because we were complete novices, utter amateurs. We had no idea other than growing some cherry tomatoes on a London balcony um, how to grow anything, but we dove into it. And whilst doing that, of course, we opened ourselves to these often extraordinary wildlife experiences. Suddenly a flock of rose-colored starlings which occasionally passed through in spring would land in a walnut tree in our fields or a black vulture passed overhead, a bird that hadn't been recorded here for decades. But because I was out working the soil, I was actually out much more than I am now when I'm often stuck at a desk working on a computer, bizarrely. But those five years, we lived in the rain and the sun and the wind and the soil almost every single day. And so it immersed us in this landscape and the place and the histories. And on, I think, two or three occasions when digging the fields, we upturned old coins with Arabic script on them that dated from the Ottoman uh, empire when the Ottomans occupied this part of northern Greece. So the stories in many way were already there. They were already in the soil. They were already in those paths. They were in the species that uh, landed in the fields and about the people we, we met during the course of our days. So it was kind of five years of listening in many ways, which I still think is the best way to become a writer. Well, that's it for part one of this Julian Hoffman special. Be sure to listen to episode 2 for an insight into Julian's most recent book, Irreplaceable, The Fight to Save Our Wild Spaces. Thanks so much for listening and see you on the other side.